everybody, this is Jeremy Siskin. I'm the author of Playing Solo Jazz Piano and Jazz Piano Fundamentals, and I'm joined by a fabulous friend, uh, Sam Ryder, a pianist living in Oakland, California, who recently put out a really beautiful album called Petrichor. Um, Sam just got a master's in composition, um, and besides being a great jazz pianist, he plays a lot of classical and folk music and is a pretty accomplished accordion player as well. Maybe we'll have to have you back on the channel and you can like talk about the accordion a little bit. That would probably be really interesting. But nice. um, Sam, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's good to see you too. It's been a long time. Yeah, so I've been listening to Petrichor and we, we decided that we would focus on this very first track. I guess maybe the first thing, sorry, not the first track, the title track of, of the album. Maybe the first thing that we should do is just, what does the word Petrichor mean? Yeah, it's a great word that I learned last year. Um, it means the fresh smell of the earth after a first rain. It's a very potent um, word here in California where it really, we're in constant drought. Um, but also uh, it smells beautiful um, uh, in, in the mountains. Um, at, right after a first rain, you get all of the scents of the um, native plants. Um, it's it's something it's a it's a feeling that has always really brought me home here to california um and this record was a homecoming for me because i lived in new york city for 15 years and only moved back to the bay area in 2019 um and i also uh, just hadn't done a whole lot of solo piano and never had put out a solo piano record before so in that way it was also sort of a homecoming back to my roots as a pianist yeah, beautiful. And so much of the piece is based around this opening ostinato kind of vamp and the way that it transforms. Um, and we were just talking about it because I did my own little transcription. Um, and um, if you don't mind me, me playing it, then Please. you can play it better. Um, and what was so interesting to me is that you wrote it in 12-8. So it looks like that um, in your handwriting. So the pulse the way that you conceive it is right but i actually looked at it and i had written it let me see if i can get to my transcription i'd written it like this in three four <laughs> I, I don't know if i can even play it like this after hearing it the other way and i, I think it's it's so cool that it could really work both ways absolutely I think it to totally functions both ways um, do you want to talk about this opening um, yeah. vamp? How did you come up with that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I used to, um, well, when I lived in New York um, and was coming home late from gigs um, on the subway, I always enjoyed stopping at Grand Central Station um, if it was late at night. Uh, maybe you remember this guy. There's this guy, Francois who is a West African balafone musician who would play um, on the 4-5 platform at Grand Central. Um, and he was amazing. Um, the balafone, for those of you that don't know, is a West African instrument. It's like a xylophone. It has gourds hanging underneath the bars. And the way it's played is with these really amazing repeating ostinatos, often in triple meter or six or 12. Mm -hmm. um, and he would improvise um, singing over it. I have no idea what he was, what the words were. He was probably just improvising about people he was seeing on the train platform. But it was incredible. The rhythmic, the layering of his, the vocal rhythm over the ostinato, I was just like totally enchanted by it. And I used to jam with him a little bit with the on the accordion when I had it with me, except that his balafone was always, I think it was in F sharp. And so it was like kind of tough to play <laughs> along with him. But anyways, I was just very inspired by that. And I've always been drawn to sort of looping ostinato patterns. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of great solo Keith Jarrett repertoire. Yeah, I thought about facing you a little bit um, in terms of this, this track and um, that yeah. very first, first yeah, track. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've always loved that. And um, and. I, I kind of like got it in my head that I wanted to like be able to blow to improvise over ostinatos mm -hmm. and I've spent years working on that and so with this I wrote this li this little ostinato maybe a decade ago and I spent many years just practicing improvising over it wow. and it never it never really blossomed into a tune or into a song uh, I never performed it or anything it was just more of a, a practice thing 
I always wanted it to be this thing. I dre I was kind of dreaming of being able to like really play it live in an improvised mm -hmm. fashion, but it was beyond the scope of my technique. So I <laughs> never did it. Um, but over the course of many years, I kind of developed a bunch of um, melodic ideas that could fit on top of it. And um, it kind of just stewed. <laughs> I would play it at sound checks. You know, mm. many, many, many people have heard me playing this thing <laughs> over the last decade. It wasn't until last year when I finally decided it was time to bite the bullet and and maybe sort of codify a lot of the stuff that I've been working on. Yeah. Um, so that's and that's what we have here with Petricor. So it this really grew out of a long time of improvisation. Um, but the piece that I ended up with is a is a pretty structured, comp like formal composition in the sense that um, it's very um, there's a lot of symmetries there's a lot of like compositional techniques at work and it the reason that it's like that is because it really took me applying a lot of the sort of like formal techniques of composition to this ostinato to break out of my sort of free form improvisation that. I, I it would it never went anywhere when I was just improvising it. I could never take 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 it on a journey the way that I wanted it to. Yeah. Can I ask a couple of follow up questions? Yeah. So first of all, I'm just curious. Like my analytical brain really divides this into two parts. Like yeah. I really hear and then and maybe I don't know which one this which part the C sharp is part of. Right. Are you thinking about it in two parts? Or are you thinking about it as kind of one line or kind of you can flip and Yeah, well, I think also from a symmetrical standpoint, right? It's there's a there's an inverted rhythmic symmetry in the measure. Mm. Oh, interesting. Um, so you're, and, you're saying like the rhythm on on yeah. both sides of this is like a mirror. Exactly. And that's a theme uh, for the piece and also oh, for, so cool. for a lot of the record, there's a lot of inversion that happens and I'll show you in this piece how it works, but um, I hear rhythmically, um, yes, there's a bass line going on, um, and I I hear these units of three. That's why I wrote it in twelve. Yeah. The these sort of cluster voicings um, uh -huh. are important in the harmonic development of the piece and also oh. in the melody that happens in the right hand. Oh, interesting. Um, cool. Okay, so, so then my my second question is. When you go to practice improvising over this ostinato, do you have yeah. a favorite exercise, a favorite techniques, favorite activities? Can you show us a couple? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, when I'm doing any ostinato, and that includes, um, you know, simple stuff like playing stride, that counts as an ostinato too. Mm -hmm. um, I like to just um, use the metronome and go really slowly and practice constant rhythms in the right hand on top of the left hand so whether that's start starting out probably just doing for this i would probably just do downbeats <coughs> and i'd probably double it then four At that point, then you have to make some decisions. Um, I, I would definitely do eighth notes, so that's one to one counterpoint with the left hand. And and that was just the E major scale, right? But I'd probably right. also practice then applying other scales over it. Uh, scale over it. and then I would and then eventually I would sort of when I felt comfortable with the rhythm I might break away from playing scales and play more free improvisation Sorry. Um, and, and start playing with rhythms you know I'd this is really, we both studied with Fred. This is a real Fred kind of approach to improvisation. I would take one 
uh, I'd give myself a limitation. I would take a motivic idea, a rhythmic pattern, and play it with all in all sorts of different keys. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, Iterating anything I can think of over the ostinato. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, that that was really my approach, and out of that really blossomed a lot of stuff. But what I really wanted was a lot more rhythmic freedom than what I could improvise. I wanted complex right. polyrhythms happening over this, different groupings. Right. And Which so is that a great was like, next. Yeah. yeah, great introduction to what I kind of think of as the main theme, is that fair to say, which starts at B? Exactly. Right, in which, okay, I think I transcribed this more or less correctly. Oh, it's not quite fives. It's no. five, four, and then five, five, four, five. Um, shoot, I wish we had this on a single line. Um, but do you want to play? a single line on the next page, actually. Okay, do you want to play starting at B, and yeah. we can listen and follow along? And I'll make the iPad bigger. Yeah, sure. So I'll play it slow. Yeah. Yeah, it's so hip. It's so it you can kind of think of it. I I kind of think about that first measure as five four th uh, uh five four three. So we're looking at. I know this isn't the first measure, but this no, same exactly. really pattern, right? Yeah, and it's just a really great, cool way of dividing up twelve beats. Oh yeah, five plus four plus three. Five, plus three, four, plus four, three. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so you'll see that return many times in the piece. Um, if That's you so cool. if you sort of then look to the connecting next measure. Mm -hmm. You can also think of the whole theme as being five, four, five, nine, if you're talking about numbers of eighth notes. Okay, yeah, so cool. So then this one here is nine yeah. eighths, which is that intentionally the same as five plus four? Or are you kind of thinking in that sym symmetry? Um, honestly, really. <laughs> the, the, the melodic idea, this theme, really was just an improvised idea. This was all I had to work with when I started writing the piece. I had the ostinato and I had this. So simple and it's so little information. I think that was part of what the struggle really was with this um, piece was like how to even take it somewhere with such simple starting mm -hmm. information. There's not yeah. even a leading tone. There's right. no um, leading tone in, in the music. Right, and it kind of, it, it brings that the pentatonicness of the melody also kind of evokes that African kind of um, thought yeah. uh, that you're talking about from from, yeah. uh, from your inspiration. Okay, so then next, t tell me about this next part where uh, yeah. you're, you're kind of going in between three notes. C can you maybe play it and then talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. So... This one I probably owe to Keith. This is a very Keith. Ah, okay. Very Keith I wouldn't. That wouldn't have occurred to me. Um, but also, again, so there's there's a bunch of things going on here. One is just like kind of interesting cross rhythms against the left hand, and it's not very. Um, I wouldn't say it's very um, formulaic how I how I've done it. It was more okay. about just creating <clears throat> syncopation and rhythmic counterpoint with the left hand. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you broke it apart, though, let's see, we have three, two, two. It, it's not, there's nothing formulaic about it, but what I will say is melodically, it's related to the initial theme. So if we had... Definitely. And then um, this is the development of it. Yes. It's so simple when you play it with just one note. I've harmonized it in parallel triadic harmony. Which 
which has not been the easiest thing to practice playing. It's definitely been challenging. Um, it's kind of, I, I cheat a little bit. Um, I do, sometimes it's, I just do two notes. Uh -huh. I, but if you have the pedal down, no one can really tell. <laughs> um, this, I think this is another, th this whole first section is really just melody that I heard um, and it was not, I, I didn't think about it very scientifically. It was just, mm -hmm. just, this was the piece initially. Nice. And yeah, I just wanted to compliment you. Speaking, speaking of pedal, I, I love these measures, um, like this one, where you're hitting these high melody notes. And I, I was playing it through before we signed on, and I think like your pedaling is very cool. Like, um, and yeah. you know, you're kind of forming again. I could hear the melody in those, those bars, at least implicitly a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I, I thought the way that you pedaled that was really smart and really, really artful. Well, and here you can, in that section, you can see why I divided this in groups of three, too, You because you can see the development mm. of those uh, three-note figures moving up the piano. Yeah, I was hearing it as one, two, three, yeah, one, two, three, <laughs> and then it becomes more syncopated. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so... You ref oh, I did want to look at this next part at, at yes. C. Uh, can you play this? So here you're playing the same melody. You're repeating the melody again, but you have this bottom line that yeah. kind of almost serves as, it feels almost like an echo or a ricochet off of it. But rhythmically, it's so interesting. I was attempting to kind of play it before you signed on, and I, I couldn't quite figure it out. Yeah. Um, so but it, do you mind playing that passage? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um... <laughs> That's so cool. So, so you're repeating the same melody an octave below. How many beats later? Two, half, beats, two, two, like yeah. Yeah, two half the measure later. later. Yeah. Beat. So it's it's a canon. It's in canon. Yeah. It's so. See, weird. I actually I actually didn't realize that when I was yeah. listening to it. Yeah. This I this idea I really can't take credit for. I completely put <laughs> this to my mentor, um, my composition teacher Ken Briggs, who's this total genius, and I've studied with him for about five years. Um, and as I was working on this piece, this was one of his main suggestions. He was like, you have That's this really cool. simple idea. Why don't you start exploring it in canon in various ways in the piece? And then you'll and have then I love, voices going. At some point you had an F natural. I'm right. So, that on the bottom, which I thought was really, that was really kind of fun. Right. Because so. Oh, that's not till later, actually. That's not till later, okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I didn't want it to be a strict, you'll see, it doesn't stay as a strict canon, It's but rhythmically, the idea of canon is there throughout. Yeah, no, it's, that's really cool. And then, so finally, we changed keys. Everything so far, am I correct, has been diatonic. There's not yeah. really been a note outside the key. And first, you kind of transform into E minor, and then, I, I haven't looked through the score, am I right that it kind of goes into a C major -y zone? G. G uh, okay. Yeah, so this was one of the huge challenges with this piece. Um, like I was saying, it was this improvised thing for years, and I I didn't know how to break out of this um, diatonic or really yeah. or almost six hexachordal. Like it was almost in this very like it this this world that had very little harmonic tension, and I I didn't know how to take it because a good composition starts somewhere goes somewhere else and then comes right. back and and my concept for the overall piece was I wanted to have waves of um, tension and release mm -hmm. and I found that very difficult with just this E major diatonic world and the breakthrough was in when I was like oh the tension doesn't have to come from a traditional sort of movement to a two five one or to a four chord or something what if I just start by flatting the third and moving to an E minor landscape. And so that's what you have here. I, now we have basically an... What is that? Is that a... a uh, that's Dorian. We go to E Dorian, basically. Uh, and then I 
I flat the C. And by doing right. that, by flatting the C, all of a sudden now we're in the key of G. And then I'm going to do the whole thing again in G. <laughs> Yeah, which was really really helpful from the perspective of developing this piece harmonically because then I finally then I had some tension because now the listener is like oh we're somewhere new and it feels great in G too. moment at E we're like this is like the cadence moment it's like okay where you can tell we're going somewhere because I'm repeating the I'm kind of developing that idea and then we move back to the key of E and that's mm. a great that's always a great harmonic movement going from Kind of like G A B E. Yeah, yeah, and I think this is where I heard the C major, the C major at least implied. Yeah, because now you're kind of in a C Lydian yeah. world. Um, and I think you sold yourself short a little bit because because you kind of just said like, oh, and now we're gonna do the whole thing again in G, but you don't do the whole thing again in G. Instead, you're actually kind of developing more of these kind of three note, interesting rhythmic ideas with triads. Um, exactly so yeah it doesn't well, yeah. feel repetitive at all oh nice um, well, yeah no it's but it feels like... it feels tightly constructed you know it feels yeah. related but not repetitive it's like the um that's why i said the word cadence it's like the um I, i've taken the smallest amount of that initial theme and i start to loop it more and more so that it can feel feel like it's building up and you feel the you actually feel the tension grow because the space between those little melodic phrases is decreasing. Oh, interesting. Da 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 da. The looping is oh, kind of getting compressed. Right. I see. And as the rhythmic, as the rhythmic element of it gets compressed, you feel the kind of like urgency of it grow. That's cool. Um, okay, I'm at. <laughs> Um, I am enjoying this. I want to keep going. Um, <laughs> we're probably like doing terribly on time, <laughs> uh, but if you're okay on time, can we keep working through this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so then we're back to E major. We're kind of back to home base, uh, yeah. letter F, and we're doing a different kind of canon. Am I correct exactly. looking at this now? Yeah. You want so to play, this play is a little bit of that like, for us. This is yeah. like you know we've done the A section. This whole piece has kind of an A, A prime, B, A prime form it's it's actually as a whole structure it's quite simple a a b a kind of so this would be sort of the second iteration of a um although it's going to go to some new places and um the canon as you mentioned now is coming in on the second dotted quarter note um and it looks like i'm trying to remember what i've done here i, I think i've left the strict melodic element of the canon behind i think i now i have yeah, so you're doing it at like a third below. Exactly. Oh, actually, that's right. So no, we're still in sort of like a canon at the third. Oh, and you had, you were talking before about about using that, and you're getting exactly you're getting those three notes in the canon. Well, but that's the thing that I realized about my melody that I had heard without even trying. Right. That sort of three note grouping it's so related already to the stuff that's going on in the left right hand. right right yeah um, so that now was, you're literally uh, playing one of the three note groups of the left hand for the count. exactly yeah okay and then uh, i i think here so yeah so here's where we get the the f the e sharp yeah um this this is actually something that i initially heard during the improvisation phase of the development of this, I was, oh. I started by kind of, there was a point uh -huh. at which I wanted to do that, but I eventually saved, I saved it for this moment because the, the sharpening of the E there is the foreshadowing for the harmonic change that's about to happen. Oh, very cool. Okay, so you kind of started with parallel major chords. To get there, yeah, um, 
but now you're just using that E sharp and it's telling us something about where we're about to go. Exactly. I love that. That's so artful. It's, um... Cool. Yeah. Sorry, I played that wrong. Yeah, can, can you play us all, all of F? Would you mind? I want to hear all these canons. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm selfish. <laughs> um, let's see. to C sharp, which was exactly which was predicted by that, that E sharp in there. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Cool. And so the reason we're going to C sharp also, we're exploring in this piece, I'm exploring the median relationships between first E and then G. So I go up a, a minor third mm, uh -huh. of the first section, and now we're going down a minor third. Uh, so there's some more of that symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And what do we need to know about this next section? At G, this is sort of like it's 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 an introduction of new harmonic material, but it's also kind of it's a transition. It's a signal that we're going somewhere new, and you'll see it doesn't last very long. Mm -hmm. um, and I know if if I'm remembering correctly, are we kind of moving rhythmically towards more of a? I know at at a certain point we get to like yeah. groups of uh, like spinning song, like kind of groups of three instead of this longer ostinato. Yeah. Um, are are yeah, we starting getting... to move there, or is that a little later, Mike? We are getting the there. Um, I hint, I hint at it right here in seventy. Right. That's that's why I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'll see here on the next page, though. Uh -huh. I go. I return. H. H is the transition point to B. The or or the second section of the piece. This mm -hmm. is exactly. Um, this is exactly halfway through the piece as far as measures go. Um, and like exactly, like exactly. Wow. So you like were really mathematical about that. Well, I, it, you'll be surprised when you start thinking about that kind of stuff. Uh huh. And you start you start noticing that a lot of music that feels right and good just kind of does it naturally. And I've found so many times in writing over the last couple of years that I just end up with. Um, being really close to halfway through. I really? think in this case, I'm one measure off. I think the whole piece maybe is a hundred is a hundred and sixty five measures. Okay, which is, is a little too. Yeah, a little bit more. You're, but you're real you can, close. <laughs> once you get once you start thinking about that stuff, it becomes really easy to fudge your way into really making it precisely. Which is what Bach did. He was revising the Well Tempered Clavier for his whole life mm -hmm. to make the pieces fit these kind of arbitrary symmetries. Um, and you'll see there's a couple moments later on in which you can tell I've I've kind of added an extra measure of ostinato just uh -huh. so that I can have the stupid pleasure of having <laughs> symmetry. Okay. But kind it. of but like from more of a the the reason there's a good reason for it also which is that at this moment I then invert the ostinato. So yes, it I was going to say moves to the right hand, and I also do an inversion across the axis of E. Yeah, and so now you get this kind of Phrygian sound. Exactly. Um, yeah, Phrygian is a good way to think about it. I just discovered in the course of writing this how interesting it was that when, when you invert the E major scale, so what I mean by inverting is to literally, instead of going up a whole step, start mm -hmm. by going down a whole step, uh -huh. then down, then a half step, you get this um, Phrygian sound. Um, oh, and but with the F sharp, uh, so that's I, I guess that's natural minor, not not Phrygian technically. <laughs> right, you're right, you're right. Um, but yeah, that uh, there's neither an F or an F sharp, so we don't really know. It doesn't matter at this point. Uh, there's about yeah. to be. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is what people are talking about when they're talking about negative harmony. Honestly, I've never really understood it. Is that your understanding? I've never understood I, it either. But somebody was explaining it to me in just the way that you said that if you go like if you're going up a step, then you go down a step, and you're creating like the inverse or the symmetrical whatever. Maybe um, yeah, that sounds right to me. But who, yeah, who cares? <laughs> 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 who cares what, what you call it? And then so I and then I see the canon. 
or at least something yeah. that kind of resembles the cannon exactly. in, the, in the left hand. Yeah, at a certain um, point, you have to leave behind the strictness of that kind of stuff because otherwise music gets really formulaic and boring. Mm. So I'm totally following my ear here. I'm adding some new accidentals to create. I'm playing with different modes, different scales, mm -hmm. you know, that use, that still center around E, but I'm playing with that B flat sound, mm. um, adding some crunchier stuff, A flat or G sharp. Cool. Yeah, you um, want to play, play it for me from H? Sure. So let's see if I can do this right. Um... Something like that. Yeah, beautiful. And then we really, at this point now, we're really into a development moment. So we're leaving behind that idea finally. I think we've had enough of it. But mm -hmm. you can see now I start to sequence those three note patterns. And then here, um, what I'm doing is I'm developing, we talked about the five, four, three rhythmic oh, groups. Uh -huh. Okay. And that's what's happening with the melody. If you look at the top line of the right hand, okay. you hear one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And the left I'm, hand. And the left hand. One, two, three. Four. So you have these C sharps coming in in five, four, yep. three. And melodically, it's also, again, the inverse or sort of the upside down of... Now I'm going. Ah, uh, da do de. Yeah. Nice. I see and, it. And then harmonically, um, I'm I just wanted to go somewhere that we hadn't been before, so I was just in this sort of E land. Okay. So now I'm going to C sharp minor. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet. final sort of development of this where now if you look at the lowest note of the right hand there's a C sharp there now the lowest note is sort of the melody it's going up. Oh. and now we're doing just a total hemiola of 5 8 over 12 uh, okay Now we've got these groups of three that I was yep. waiting for. And there's for. the groups of three. So I, what, you, what you're seeing again in terms of like the development of the, or like the, the tension building is that I was exploring these, this sort of uh, polyrhythm, the five, four, three, five, four, three, then fives. And then now I'm going to do just threes. And so when you feel the rhythm, when you feel the kind of compression of that mm -hmm. rhythm, it mm -hmm. makes the tension build. That's cool. This is one yeah. of those moments where you see there's like this kind of dead space. You could do without this measure if you wanted. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. And I'm recognizing these three notes from a bunch of other places in the tune, right? Yeah. Right. That was one of the groupings in the Absolutely, opening of yeah. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So Jay, um, now we're back at the kind of build up section that we've had before, um, except um, it, it's kind of like a new version of it. And then here's a big climax. And then here we are back at this cadential moment that we had before in the key of G, but now in the key of E. I'll play that. Um. 
Yeah. And there's kind of a fun little hint, a uh, fun little kind of like winking moment in measure 129 where you think I'm going to go back to the key of G for a second. Mm. But then I don't. Uh, and then it, it like, I, I thought actually what you're going to say about the winking moment. Oh, did is I that, lose you? Um, can you see me? Check, check, check. Oh, no. Oh, there you are. I lost okay, you. cool. I think my connection was unstable for a second. All um, good. Um, all right, we're, we're getting there. Um, and then I was kind of curious, you know, you get to, you get to forte at the, when you get to the five chord, yeah. right? And so it almost feels like a traditional, like pedal five, like Bach would do, but then you kind of undermine it and you go some other places. Um, yeah. but, um, that also feels like kind of a fun wink to like a very traditional, like I'm going to arrive at the five chord and th do one last build up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've got this big five, and it feels very, it felt a little bit. You know, you want to extend your moments of, um, mm. of, of the cadence, of the climax, as much as possible. That's a very classical thing, I guess. Like, you want to draw out those moments to make, mm. make sure people know that you've really hit it this time. I mean, if you think about yeah. the, uh -huh. the, the ends of a movement, you know, you have... So you want this you want, is not a drill, guys. Yeah, it's like we're, we're really ending. There. We're really yeah. there, um, and also just kind of an elegant way to. Like I said, I was thinking about waves, so I didn't want it to just mm. go right back to the original idea. It had to kind of die out and come back down again. Great. Um, do you want to play from that climax? Sure. Does it make yes. sense to go from there to the end, baby. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> guessing that this last you're thinking about going up by minor thirds and down by minor thirds and so you're cascading down by minor thirds yep uh, it's one it's sort of like one last it's like one last little wink at the harmonic movement of the piece yeah so just for for watchers who that might have gone by too fast for he's doing these little patterns of three that are starting this is f or e sharp starting minor thirds down um and yeah i this is so great because as I was listening to it, I was like, oh, that's kind of like surprisingly chromatic, um, you know, like with the rest of the piece. But now yeah. I like really understand the reasoning behind it. And like, of course, like that makes so much sense. Um, and then yeah. the, at the very, the very final chord is one is just also one last sort of um, fresh, again, the theme of fresh, freshness. Mm -hmm. um, stacking, you know, the whole piece has been built on a lot of this sort of these intervals of fives. Sorry, my pit bull is in the background yeah. up a blanket. It's a you know, dog friendly friend. YouTube channel. It's yeah. all good. Um, we get so many more views if there's a I'm dog. Sure. <laughs> yeah, we should get him on. Well, actually, Huckleberry was present for most of the composition of this piece, sleeping okay. on my feet, so it's very fitting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if you stack those fifths all the way up, it's a great, it's a very fresh sound up there, up at the top of the piano. It's so bright. Um, yeah, and totally. I just, I don't know, I don't know if that would be a fun way to end it. Yeah. Sam, 
this has been so interesting for me. I, I'm really grateful. I don't know if anybody else is going to like this, but I've had a great <laughs> time. I've learned a lot. Um, and if people are still watching, is there – so they should listen to Petrichor, yep. um, the, whole, the whole album, not just this piece. Um, what else? Where else do people go to learn more about you? Well, just my website. It's samridermusic.com. Um, I'm also on YouTube, um, so you can find me there. Um, I have a band – called the human hands that's more of a sort of um cha like folk music meets chamber music kind of thing bluegrass and it's very upbeat and lively i play more accordion in that project i also have a record coming out this fall with an amazing venezuelan artist named jorge glem um where we play traditional venezuelan music um so all kinds of stuff uh, but yeah my website's probably the best place and is this music available for purchase petrichor oh the score not yet. It's going to be. I'm hoping to get that all finished up and put it out in the fall. If, if you want advice on that. Yeah, we'll talk. We, we can talk. Yeah. But um, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time. And, yeah, this was uh, fun. I just enjoyed getting to know this music a lot. Yeah. So thank Thanks you. for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah.